All right. All right. Welcome. Welcome to Masters of the Fly 4. We're so glad you guys could join us both uh, on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you once again. Um, tonight's a great night, but before we get started, um, as you all know, Masters of the Fly is about a, it's about community. It's not necessarily about your expertise, but it's about a shared passion for the outdoors and for the community of fly fishing. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, our team, uh, Clay Andrews and Tom Kaczynski. Without your technical support, this would be very difficult. Um, uh, I also want to thank Chris Windrum at uh, saltwaterflies.com. Your help in this is, has been amazing, and uh, your little boxing video this week was super. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, on, on my end, uh, Tail Fly Fishing Magazine, thank you. And um, for those of you who uh, are not subscribers to Tail, in the upcoming issue, we're going to have Masters of the Fly featured. So, uh, you know, pony up, get a subscription to see what we're all about. Um, Lou. And it really is, a, it's the best, it's the best fly fishing magazine out there. So uh, you owe it to yourself, subscribe. Um, it's a must. Um, thanks, David. Um, uh, just want to also just um, mention um, uh, our friends at uh, uh, Saltwater Edge, um, the American Saltwater Guys Association. Just a couple of quick housekeeping logistics here. So you'll see, for those of you who've been on this before, this is familiar, but there's a there's a chat icon and there's a Q&A icon. So if you have, if you want to chat about anything while we're doing this tonight, just put it in the chat window. If you have a question you specifically want to ask Eric, Johnny, any of us here, uh, any of the participants, just put it in the Q&A and, and uh, uh, David and Eric and I will moderate that. Um, uh, there's a raise hand function. So if you're tying your Johnny King kinky muddler and you have a question, you want to show what you've done, uh, hit the raise hand and we can actually put you on the screen and you can uh, interact with the whole team uh, and the group. Uh, this is meant to be interactive. No requirement to do that, but if you want to raise a hand, we'll monitor that. Um, and then please also for those following along and tying, or even if you do this subsequently, take photos of the flies at your time uh, and post them to Insta and Facebook with the hashtag up here, um, hashtag Masters of the Fly. We will repost it on our social feeds as well. Uh, it's really fun just to see how everyone is uh, sort of um, interpreting uh, what Johnny's doing tonight. Um, and that's about it. I that we wanted to spend a, just a couple minutes. I'm going to hand it over to Tom Kaczynski here uh, because of the timing of this event. Uh, wanted to make sure we um, asked all of you for one big favor, uh, which is to um, write an email um, on behalf of all of us who are um, striped bass fishermen um, to support um, uh, the, the recent uh, striped bass uh, management, fisheries management um, uh, legislation um, and, and strategy. It's, it's uh, very confusing and very complicated, but to break it all down in about 30 seconds, I'm gonna hand it over to Tom in terms of what you could actually really do tonight to help us all. So with that, Tom, let me turn it over to you real fast. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, as many of you know, the Atlantic States Marine Fish Fisheries Council, also known as ASMFC, is currently developing Amendment 7 for striped bass management, and they've issued a public information document, PID for short. Um, the document's extremely important because it's going to govern how striped bass are managed in the years to come. Amendment 6 is what the council is currently working off, and that was developed 18 years ago. Um, so with the striped bass population at a 25-year low, it's important that our voices are heard on Amendment 7. And here's how you can take action. The council does not accept form emails, so a personal email stating the importance of striped bass to you and one that highlights your stance on the most important issues is going to be the most effective way to communicate to them. These issues are biological reference points, stocker building and target schedule, and conservation equivalency. The Guides Association position on each of these is highlighted um, in the link that we're going to share in the chat. If you scroll down, you'll see each of these issues highlighted in bold. 
Um, so what you want to do is, in your own words, write why each of these is important, and you could use the guide, the guide's association language, as as a guide to crafting your own message. Um, these comments should be sent to comments at asmfc.org, and you'll also want to copy your state's Stripe Bass board members. And there's a, a list to all those folks on the website that we're going to send to you. Um, and in addition, if you want to if you want to st attend your state's virtual meetings. Um, and make your comments in person, there's also a link to do that. Um, so for more information regarding the PID, links to register for the state's meetings and other helpful resources, uh, we'll put the link in the chat. Thanks and enjoy the time. Great. Thank you, Tom. Thanks um, a lot, Tom. Um, remember everybody, uh, please look at that in the chat and pick it up. Um, and also, uh, before we move on, don't be shy, use the raise hand uh, icon. Uh, this is interactive, so, uh, Jump on in anytime you want. All right. So again, welcome to Masters of the Fly. We're coming to you tonight with one of the coolest cats who not only is a great jazz pianist, but who can tie some seriously cool flies as well. I met Johnny in the early 90s when I was at Eddie Bauer. As kindred spirits, we hit it off and stayed in touch over the years. And what's interesting, and it's kind of funny, when one bumps into an old friend and catches up, now things change yet remain the same. Uh, for me and Johnny, it's fly fishing and his evolution from a great freshwater artist to saltwater artist uh, has just been amazing. Johnny is both a great ear and an eye and that's what separates him from the crowd. And with that, I'm throwing tonight's program to our moderator extraordinaire, Eric Schatzker and Johnny King. David, thanks very much. Uh, this is gonna be a fabulous session with Johnny King. As I have said to a couple of people over the past few days, there is no Venn diagram. All of you are familiar with the Venn diagram, right? Those circles, those interlocking circles. There's no Venn diagram like Johnny King. He is a world-class copyright lawyer. He's a world-class jazz pianist, and you've been listening to his work. And he is a world-class, innovative, fly tire extraordinaire. Obviously, we're here for the last part. But find me one other person on the planet whose three circles intersect that way. There's none. And I think that's just one of the things that you're going to find out about Johnny tonight that's so unique and so compelling and so interesting. And Johnny, the vice is in front of you. You've got a hook load it up. I want you to begin by telling everybody why we're here, what you're going to show us, what you're going to teach us, the purpose, if you will, of this session. All righty. Thank you um, for that very flattering and highly undeserved uh, introduction. I think, uh, I think what he means is I'm a dilettante, but at least I'm a happy <laughs> dilettante, right? So I have different occupations to keep me busy during uh, quarantine. Um, so I'm glad to be here. I think this is a great thing you guys have set up and I, I know you've been um, covering conservation topics, tying topics, fishing, fishing topics. So I hope to contribute to the tying topics. So what we decided to do was rather than crank out a bunch of flies, which I do at fly shops and I do at fly tying shows to spend some time in depth with one or two patterns. Um, and they're all really not patterns, they're just fly tying techniques. So I chose a fly that I call the kinky muddler which I've probably been fishing since about 2007, 2008. No, it's about 12 or 13 years. Um, I have tied thousands of them. I still break my thread. I still, they still end up lumpy and bumpy and everyone um, comes out differently and that suits me. They're not meant to be uniform. They're meant to be experiments as you go along. And if there is one piece of advice I would give anyone attempting this fly, it's not a difficult fly, but you have to have faith during the process that this abomination that is evolving on your hook that looks like cousin it, it looks like it stuck its finger in a socket, you will be able to turn that into a good looking fly. Um, so, so I came up with it in about 2008 and um, uh, do you want me to tell you the story of how I stumbled well, into this? Well, I, 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 I think before we actually get into the tying part of it, it, it is worth explaining a little bit of how you stumbled on the idea because it helps to underscore 
the point that you made just a moment ago, which is so crucial and which I want you to repeat actually a couple of times over the course of this session, which is that one of the most, imp as far as I'm concerned, and I, I think you agree because you said it and, and we've talked about it is, is the importance of a concept, right? Fly tying isn't just about imitating, right? It's, I mean, certainly you're trying to imitate something in the wild, but you're not trying to imitate another tie. You're trying to master, if you will, uh, to, you know, to borrow something from our, the title of our series, um, master a concept. So talk a little bit more about John, as you just said, Johnny, how you came upon the idea of the kinky muddler and this technique that underpins the fly. Sure. So, so there's, there really are two things that happened. Um, and a lot of these concepts and techniques um, I owe to my friend Bob Popovics, who he taught me all kinds of great um, tying techniques, but more than anything else, he, he sort of gave me insight into how you approach flies. So as I was fishing in salt water, as my flies got bigger, I noticed that certain things mechanically happened in the water. Um, and I'm hardly the first person to observe this, but you gotta sort of, you gotta learn it from your own observation. It's that when I had a fly that had some bulk up front and then had a long mobile tail wing, whatever you wanna call it, but had something to deflect the water, it swam, be it swam better than anything else. And so, you know, you call it hydrodynamics or whatever you want. If you have a bulky, bulky, dense head, the water will wash over it and it'll make the tail wiggle. So why is that important? Well, if you're on the beach and you watch a bunker swim, right? We talk about our flies breathe and we have marabou and fox fur. A, a, a bunker's head doesn't breathe, it doesn't swell. What really happens with a bunker is that tail goes like this, right? Same thing with a mullet, although it's a little different. Um, a sand is a little different, it's a snakier, but for the more full-bodied bait fish, and even little guys like bay anchovies, or check out a black-nosed dace or a baby fallfish up on the Delaware, or a sculpin. How do you get that tail to move? So I was always fascinated by these flies that had these, this bulk up front. So the classic fly that does that is the muddler minnow, right? Now the original muddler minnow doesn't have a lot of soft stuff behind it. But the thing about what most people were using for the bulk up front was that it never flowed seamlessly into the back of the fly. So I used to tie these really convoluted deer hair flies. I would sit there with the Jimmy Nicks videos. I'd have 47 different colors of deer hair. When you crank down on deer hair, it becomes instantly perpendicular. So you can't get those, those profiles of a bait fish. And when I say profiles, I don't just mean from the side. I mean, from the underside, from the top, you know, you want it to look that way in three dimensions. And that's something I learned from Bob Popovic's 3D fly. Every fly he ties, hollow flies, bucktail deceivers, they're all about dimensionality. So Bob had this really cool little squid in his book where he'd kind of, I have the actual fly, where he kind of over trimmed the ultra hair. But what was so cool about it is it had the little cylindrical shape of um, a squid. So I'm tying with, I, I, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with Steve Farrar, another great New Jersey tire. And Steve was the first guy I knew who would blend um, kinky fiber with flesh. So the stuff is called Steve for our flashboard. So I'm tying it on, I'm tying it on, I'm trying to imitate Steve Fly and it's just like, oh, I messed it up again. And I started trimming it, you know, and all of a sudden my, my adult bunker was becoming a peanut bunker was becoming a sand, right? Like I was trimming <laughs> this thing. But what I noticed was, oh my God, I have something like deer hair, but unlike deer hair, all the fibers are canted back at 45 degrees. So that's why I can create a profile like that that's uninterrupted, that looks like a bunker or I can create a squid. Whatever the bait fish is, I realized I could do it with this material. And it took me a while, but I linked it to that little squid fly in Bob's book and I futzed around with until I came up with a way. I'm sure there are thousands of other people who've done it, but I could never do that with wool. I could never do that with deer hair. And then I just knew I needed some soft stuff in back. I didn't want all this plastic stuff in back. So we have bucktail and marabou and ostrich and some craft fur works great. But it was really trying to accommodate that, that dense head with the movement in the back and yet having an uninterrupted profile. That was the whole thing for me. And so I played around with it. And I remember I used to go on this um, bulletin board, Stripers Online, and I nervously laid these things out. And, and Bob, you know, called me and said, that looks awesome, man. And I was just like the greatest moment of my life. And, you know, I've tied him huge and I've tied him little, but 
that was the genesis of that fly, trying to accomplish something mechanically that other materials um, wouldn't lend themselves to. So we have dozens of people out there who have vices in front of them right now. They've ordered all their materials from saltwaterflies.com. Why don't you get cracking and we okay. can continue the conversation as you start to put the materials um, on the hook. Okay, so yeah, and so and since, since we're gonna spend a little time on this, I'm gonna try not to, first of all, I'll put on my middle-aged reader glasses. Um, so there's a lot of different materials. I, I, I will tie what to me is the original version of this fly and also the one that I probably still like the best. I used to crank these out for a guy who goes down to Baja for rooster fish. There's a fish down there called a sardina and a sardina looks a lot like a bunker and it's kind of tannish back. So I started tying it this way and it's kind of become my general purpose pack. So let's talk a little bit about materials. This is uni mono. It is tiny. It is very easily broke. Well, I'll show you how easily broken it is. We'll just tie it onto the hook shank, right? Most people will pick up their scissors. This is what I'll do. And that's all I'll do. The reason I like this is it doesn't bulk up, but it grabs synthetic materials very well. So there's all kinds of stuff we can do here. But I think what you'll notice about a lot of bait fish pattern, including some of those that I tie is the proportions aren't right. People put a saddle hackle that's six inches long back here, it'll be long and skinny. Then they'll try, let's say a big bulky head here and you'll lose that sense of dimension. So you always have to think, am I gonna have that general bait fish shape? Like let's say it's a mullet. So let's tie sort of a generic bait fish kind of somewhere between that mullet, which is cylindrical, bunker, which is a little wider. Um, and, and we'll go, as we go along, I'll show you how you can accomplish um, both of those profiles. So here's a bucktail. Um, I know when we were warming up, Eric admired this bucktail. It looks great. It's not the greatest because it flares a little, but it's got nice wavy hair. I like wavy hair. Straight bucktail will tend to flare. So what I like to do is get a pretty handsome size um, clump there, probably more than you normally would, let's say, if you were tying a bucktail deceiver. I want this to create some actual volume. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but you know, in deer hair, they, uh, when you're spinning deer hair, they always talk about a pencil. This is easily a pencil's worth. Um, I like I mean, to we, cut we it off. We can see that great right now. The overhead view in particular, we can really see what you got there. You can see it. So here's a, here's a really good trick for attaching almost any material to a hook shank. So if I just put that down there and I crank down on it, first of all, it's all gonna be on top of the hook shank, right? I do that, just crank down. Second of all, I'm gonna start to flare it and it's not going to, um, it's not gonna have the smooth, gradually tapering profile that I want. So what I'll do, and by the way, this hook is a, this is a short chain hook. It's a Varivas 990. I think this is a two watt. Um, this brand tends to run a little um, big. I like this hook because if you see, it has that big, big sweeping keel. And what's great about that is it really makes the fly track. So what you'll observe with this fly is that if you just strip it with a regular strip, it'll bob right to left. But if you put it under your arm and you rip it back, like you have to do for rooster fish, it'll track perfectly. And this hook or any hook with a nice, deep, heavy bend um, will help uh, that process. The other thing I'd notice about the Varivas hook is if you notice it drops directly down, right? Not like a gamakatsu that sweeps back. One of the problems with, with hook bends that sweep back before they curl back in is they have a tendency to foul. This dropping straight down will minimize fouling. All right, so we got our thread on there. Here's what I like to do. Take that clump of bucktail and just trap it in like one or two wraps of thread. It's like a little noose around the thread. Then use your fingers to distribute it around the shank. And the best way to get it around the shank is to tighten, right? And loosen it. And every time you loosen it, now I don't know if this level of detail is coming through, but every time, you loosen it, you can redistribute it around the chain. So for you guys who tie like hollow flies or bucktail deceivers, you know how important it is to have right. um, that 360 degree distribution. But the best way to check that we have that is to turn that to the underside. So that looks pretty good, but I sort of feel like there's a little more on top. So just loosen it and squeeze it. Now, if I was like tying what a, you would do with a hollow fly, but actually bat in reverse instead of exactly. tying it. Exactly, and it's much easier. It's You might do this with a bucktail deceiver. It's 
it's much easier to do it when you're tying it forward, right? Because you don't have all the fiddling of getting your um, tips forward. So now here's another thing, another Bob Popovich technique. If I think that I'm gonna tie a real wide bodied one, not so much a mullet, but like a bunker that's tall top to bottom, I might loosen that and squeeze it really tight side to side. Then it's gonna flare up and down. If I want it to be a little bit more like a mullet, I'll let it go 360 degrees and I won't tighten it um, by squeezing it side to side. So what I'll do is I'll bind those butts down, right? Okay, so we have a pretty good distribution there. And this, by the way, works with, uh, I do this with craft fur. I do this with uh, squimpish hair, which is another material we're gonna talk about. So what I like to do is I like to put saddle hackles on this. Um, I brought a couple, here's kind of a, rusty brown, this is really just a generic, I think they call this a four B, a whiting four Bs rooster cape. It's about 20, 25 bucks. Um, and um, here's what's called a Metz Magnum saddle. These are my favorite. These are a little harder to find. What you're looking for is a triangulated saddle. So you don't want necessarily a long, narrow flat wing saddle, nor do you want like the big kind of wide neck hackle that you might use for a deceiver or a tarpon fly with splayed wings, you want a kind of a longish taper. And you can put anything, you can put yellow, pink, um, but we're gonna do sort of a, a general 10 over white. So you pick this up, right? Now, here's some tricks on, on selecting saddle hackles. So that's a nice feather, right? But it's not nice for my purposes. That's really wide. And I'm gonna tie them in um, using an Atlantic salmon fly tires technique. I'm gonna tie them in tented. They're actually gonna be at 45 degree angle on either side of the hook because I want the top of this um, tail body to basically curve up like the dorsal surface of a bait fish. Um, the other thing is if I tie them in that way, it doesn't have to be perfect. They don't have to be the same length. It creates this kind of open cavity underneath. So if you guys watch any underwater videos or, you know, you, you know, it's a little hard to see from above the water, but often the belly of a fish will wash out. Like if you hold a bunker or let's say a snapper bluefish in your hands, right? It's, it's a solid opaque thing, but that belly will kind of disappear. So I'm a little less concerned with filling in this area, but I want that dorsal surface. So I'm gonna to try to avoid the super wide saggles, but I'm also gonna to try to avoid the things that are too skinny because they're not gonna have enough profile. And I usually put, I don't know, uh, maybe two pairs, three pairs. And it's always a challenge but you know, there's always one more hackle on the neck. So that's a pretty good one. That to me has that perfect triangular shape, right? And the risk it if it's too wide, Johnny, is that you just don't get, it doesn't create I'll that. show you, I'm gonna, here, I'll do one right now and you'll see what happens. If I tie this in, right? Here's a real wide one. When mm -hmm. I try to tent it, all of right. that is gonna, it's not gonna create the, if you look at that surface, I'm trying to create an angle there and an angle there. The, the top edges of these two are going to interfere with each other and they're going to um, cant out of, uh, out of the orientation that I want. So I'll show you. So here's what I would consider a pretty good one. It's maybe a little longer than the bucktail. I'll grab the fluffy stuff. I'll hold it at a 45 degree angle and I'll just do one wrap, right? You don't need anything more than one wrap. I did a second wrap, but there's no pressure because if I crank on this, it's gonna make it roll and torque it over the edge of the fly. So let's get another one. Again, looking for something that's in the same ballpark, although I actually like to have some uneven edges there. So what we'll do is, it's a little wide at the bottom, right? If you guys can see that. So what I'll do is I'll pull it back a little bit so we don't have too much width there. I'll hold it at 45 degrees and I will do the same thing, right? So now you see the top edges of those two um, hackles. And remember, I pulled this one back a little shorter. That's totally fine, are meeting at the top. So what I have is I've got that bucktail filling out the bottom, but I've got that kind of tented shape at the top. So that's kind of a pale tan. I like, I find that a lot of bait fish have kind of a bronzy, almost orangish cast um, to the top. So this is a little bit of a darker saddle. I'll go find two more saddles. These ones look okay. You can do two, you can do three. Grizzly saddles look great. Neck hackles are a little hard because the stems are thicker. When you have a stick, th thick stem, 
um, say that three times fast. Uh, when you have a thick stem, it'll get it'll be very hard to seed it. But again, I'm just going to lay this on top here. It's just a little dark. It's probably not so visible in the video, but I have kind of something between. It's like a rusty tan. Now I had this one's a little shorter, but I can hide it under that. And you know, like you know, in sort of in Kenny Abrams style, you can layer a hundred different colors on here. But I don't like to have too much stuff back there because remember the premise of this fly mechanically was that we want it to, we want maximum mobility back. Okay, so I, can you guys see, I don't know, um, yeah, Louie Ann, can, can it, you it see how good. that's tented? Yep, totally, yep. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna crank down on this really hard and get rid of all this extra stuff. Johnny, I, I, it's interesting that I noticed you don't trim the base of those uh, feathers before you tie a lot of time, I leave all the webbing on there and the long stem. Does that help yes. you to position it better and tie it in better? Yes, because what would happen is if I had this sucker tied in right here and I, and I lifted it up to cut it, it would take those, those feathers out of orientation. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I just, I had no thread pressure. I just had the weight of the bobbin holding them in place. Now that I've got them in place, I can crank on them, but that's because I already have them oriented that way. And if I really want to make sure that they remain oriented that way, here's the, I'll show you two other tricks. One is I could just lift up the tail like this and wrap under it. So that will prop it up a little bit, but I can even, if I want to really make sure they never foul, I can actually go, are you, can you see what I'm doing? I'm actually going around the, the, yep. I'm not going around the hook. Let me do it again. And you're going underneath the hair as well as the feathers there. So, so first I'm going underneath the hair. If I do two or three there, that props it up. And that's adequate. I can tell that this is properly oriented. So I don't need to do more. But what I can do, and let's say you had a bunch of ostrich earl, you had a bunch of flash. Um, you know, we wanted to make it a little longer, let's say. Um, here, we'll do it. We'll throw in, sometimes you could do, um, three pairs of saddle hackle. I, I don't like to do more than three. I find that after a while, it, it's just superfluous. It's just it's just more stuff that adds weight. Um, so here, we'll do one more here, right? Make it a little longer. One, two. Um, find another one. This one's a little shorter, but that's okay. I don't mind. Again, lay it on top, right? So Luyen, I am not cutting those because if I cut that first one, it would kick it out of alignment. What right. I can do now is crank, hold them tight, pinch them in my hands, crank down on them, cut this, and then I haven't compromised their orientation. So I hope that, does that answer your question? I yeah, know that totally does. I, I also noticed you haven't been using any adhesive at this point. I don't use adhesive until I glue on the eyes and these, these flies do not fall apart. I have a friend who runs trips down in Ba, and I think he had caught 15 rooster fish up to 60 pounds on them. They were all big rooster fish, like 40, 60 pounds. And he was still using the same one and the eyes hadn't even come off. So you don't need adhesive because all of this, remember I'm using this thread. Odds are I'll break this thread before we finish this mm -hmm. fly. But it's, it's not about heavy thread. It's not about pressure because all of this is gonna be covered by the synthetic material. So. Once again, wrap that under there. If I want to do a gathering wrap around the entire tail, but then I skip the hook, right? That cocks it up a little bit. Now, I don't particularly want that, but we could do that. I'll tie back on it. So that will never foul. So now you can see, um, I don't know how well that, I think that comes through pretty well. In the yeah, it, come, it comes through nicely. And you can see from all different orientations, you know, you can give it the whole hot water bath. Um, it's got that top kind of, um, you know, tented quality that I like. So let's get to the, the kinky muzzler part. But but this tenting technique I use on a lot of flies. I'll, I'll show you guys some later. Um, hey, Johnny, can I just jump in for one second and ask you a sure. question? I, I've noticed as you're tying that you seem to have no qualms about just sort of wrapping extra mono around as you go. -ish. Nope. This stuff is so fine. You'll see when we when we get to the front um, of this fly, 
This stuff is so fine that it doesn't it doesn't build up. But this fly looks hideous until you're done with it. We're gonna have clumps. It's gonna look awful. But it's every mess you make is gonna be hidden by the next clump of synthetic material until I'm gonna switch up the procedure for the front of the fly. Um, so so I don't mind. But again, I don't bother with adhesives. Um, I, I just glue on the eyes, but this will hold together this way. And this, because I've got those three red thread wraps around that, you know, fouling is the most annoying thing, right? Particularly for fish, uh, you know, have you ever been in like a striper blitz and your, and your whatever it is, your deceiver fouls, it's the worst thing in the world, right? Or, you know, the roosters are finally coming up, you're ripping that fly through and then it feels funny. Why is it swimming funny? And it's, and it's only swimming on the category an hour into it unfortunately <laughs> what'd you say you only realize it about an hour and yeah of course or then sometimes you i've i've fished for like 45 minutes with a broken hook and i'm like why do i keep losing these fish johnny um, quick quick quickly a question just came up uh since sure. you're on this part of the fly i, th I think mm -hmm. it's appropriate do you ever use flash in the tail um i do not so much i mean you know there's flash in this um in this uh, Ferrar blend. And I just, it's the right amount of flash. Uh, rooster fish, I, I find don't like flash. I, stripers, it kind of depends. I've always sort of generally subscribed to the theory that clear water, shallow water, flash doesn't work. And yet I remember once being in a striper bliss on Cape Cod and the only thing that they would eat was like the flashiest, gaudiest um, Dave Skokes mushy. So, um, but like where I fish in New York Harbor in that dirty water, actually flash, sometimes seems to kind of turn them off for reasons I can't explain. Um, now, um, I do- So, so in other words, it, if, if, ahead, if, uh, if I take the point, you can experiment with it, but you don't find that it's been essential. No, but, but you know, I use so many different materials back here, both synthetic and, and non-synthetic. What I like about the flash that's blended into the Ferrar blend, it's very fine. It kind of glows, but it's not that, you know, sometimes flashaboo can look a little gaudy to me. Yeah, or crystal flash, same with crystal flash too. Yeah, there's there's a trout streamer that's very popular called a Creelex, and it's a clouser made 100% of flash. And I said, there's not a self-respecting brown trout who would eat that. And I saw this kid just like, you know, just clean up with one of them. So I think a lot of our, and on some really selective fish, you know, who you could, I could spend four hours trying to catch one fish with a size 18 sulfur. So, um, but one of the things about flash in this material is it doesn't just add flash, it completely changes the mechanical properties of this. So if you use regular slinky fiber, first of all, it'll feel coarser, right? Because each of these individual fibers, they actually vary by fiber, are much thicker than the angel hair. But if there's 20% angel in there, hair in there, it's less coarse. It's also less buoyant. Pure. Um, uh, synthetic without, particularly this synthetic, without flash in it, because it's so, um, um, it's got so many kinks in it, has a tendency to trap air. So a fly like this, you know, you throw it on a, uh, an intermediate line, it'll track. It's not a, this is not a dive bombing fly. If I wanted to dive bomb this, I'd put a tungsten cone in there or use a sinking line. But, um, but so the flash has both a mechanical and a visual property. The other thing is that if you guys have tied with this stuff, you'll find that different colors have different properties, different feels. So this stuff is called Rusty Camel. Kind of nice and soft. It's got a little reddish orange flash in it. But I have other versions of this where the hair is really thick and coarse. It's not that I can't use it, but it makes a fly with a different kind of texture. All right, so let's, let me show you the basic technique here. One trick with using this stuff, because I'm sure you've all used it, and it's like you find it in your pasta and your hair. Um, pinch it in the bag like this. Grab what you want and hold as tight as you can while just pulling out the amount you need. So there we have that. That's a pretty thin amount, right? Thinner than I'm going to need. So I will double it over like that and cut it. Now, one thing, a question I've gotten a lot in, in tying this fly is, um, do you pre-taper the material? And I never pre-taper the material because we're going to do that all by trimming. The guts, the meaty part of this fly is going to be on the front half. These ties here are mostly just going to create a veil to, to sort of bleed into the, the tail area. So what I do is, first tie I always do is on the bottom. Um, am I, can you guys see, see right there, um, 
Luyan? Yeah, we can see it. It's great. Okay, so I'll take this, right? I'll get a little bit ahead of the bend and I'll hold it right there. I don't need much. I'm just letting it go back past the hook bend an inch or so. And I'll trap it with one or two loose, tra loose wraps. That's not, that's not intended to hold it there. That's to hold it in place, but I haven't bound it to the hook. Then I will fold it back so that the other side straddles the hook shank, right? Then I will catch that. And why did I do that? Just to show you, I'm gonna leave that in place, but just to show you guys, I'm sure some of you guys have tied but high ties. Johnny, everybody's noticing that, that, as I am at the moment, that one side, one, the fibers on one side are much shorter than they are on the other. Yeah, that's because I don't care. I'm just using this. Got it. I'm, I'm gonna snip this off and use it next. There's, there's no, re you know what it's like, if any of you guys are um, trout tires and you are, let's say, tying spinner wings, you might tie um, spinner wings in like this, you know, uh, figure eight wraps. So you get them served. So that's, yep. that's where I learned to do this. Mm. But um, the typical high tie that people tie with synthetics is they fold the material back on top of itself, right? So you tie it there and you fold it back right. and then bind it down. Why did I do it as a V tie? Because the entire purpose of this fly is to create that dimension, that three dimensional um, quality. So let's say this is a little mullet or a little sardina. Um, I bet you that there are guys on this phone call who, um, if there are any people from the West Coast who will know what a sardina looks, it looks like a little like bunker. It's a little rounder, it's a little less deep bellied. Um, so I want that width there. So check that out. I'll turn it this way, you guys can see it, and I'll turn it this way. So forget the fact that that's longer because we're going to trim that all away. It's basically a V, right? So I call this V time. It's not, there's no magic to it. It's just, a, it's like doing a lateral um, high time. So I'll take this material, same deal. And just since I know people will ask, I can either go in front of that lump or I can go up on that lump. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty big lump back there. So I'll probably go up on that lump to just make sure that this is um, not too visible when we trim the fly down. And by the way, if you do a lousy job trimming and those, those under wraps are visible, sometimes the fly fish is better. Sometimes, mm. it, you know, it's not an art fly, right? It's meant to be fished. And sometimes the gnarlier the head, the better. So I have that long piece there, right? Obviously, I'm not worried about where that's going to fit. I probably have enough, eh, that might not be long enough to use for the next application. So unfortunately, this is a technique that uses a lot of material. So let me make sure I understand what you just did there. So you're doing another V tie, but now you're doing it um, high and I low did, as opposed to laterally. No, no, no. I did a V tie oh, right sorry. on top. You want me to do it again? Oh, you tied it right on top. Okay, I got you. Okay, so that's yeah. right on top. Of it. So, and so, you know, these are basically equal right now. I could, I could grab this extra stuff. I'll just do it for illustration purposes. Trim that off, get right in there. Now that I've sort of got the drape material back, I can, you know, be a little more economical, use smaller amounts. Here's the trick with this. If I use a really heavy clump, that clump, that little tie-in point is going to be really, really thick. So this is a thicker clump, right? Johnny, it, just one second. Are, are you tying that? It looks to be slightly on top of the shank of the hook. Is it on it the is. side? Oh, okay, it is. Yeah, so let's, re let's redo it because I think, you know, there... It, even with both angles, it, you guys may not be able to see it. So basically, so I, after the V, which is is lateral, you're now basically high time to build. No, nope, I uh, until we get to the hook eye, everything is going to be a V. Everything is going to straddle the hook shank left or okay. okay near shank, far shank. So check it out. Um, if you look from the top down view, everybody can see the top down view, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I will hold it there at a forty five degree angle, right? Just hold it in my left but on, hand. But on top of the hook shank. On top of the hook shank, right. It. It's not up and down. It's it's lateral. In other words, it's like this. Yep. It's not, it's not up and down. And we'll have an opportunity to tie up and down. I'll hold it laterally, do one or two reps, right? So yeah. this is the near side of the hook shank. Then I'll gently fold that back on the yeah. far side of the hook shank. And what that does is it creates that little, like there's a little fold of material there. I just catch that with one or two thread wraps. But so the, material, you, the materials seem to be folding back over top at about a 30 degree angle. 
Well, exactly. So, so what's happening is, um, here, I'll point it this way. Can you see that there's, in, in the front view, you can see that it's creating a, a V. And the mm -hmm. reason it's creating a V is because I tied it in, right? I tied it in like this. I folded it back and I created a V. The way to create the V, well, let's do it on the underside. So this, by the way, this long piece of material there, um, this long piece is just like a material holder for me. It just keeps it out of the way. Mm -hmm. So now, um, and it might be harder, you know, I don't know if everyone can see the overhead view, um, but so imagine now that the, the, the hook is oriented completely upside down. I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Now hold it along the hook shank, right? Just take it in your hands, cant it, take your left hand, pull it towards you, tie it in um, at that angle, Catch it, right? One, two, three. Fold it back. So I just need enough thread pressure there right. to hold that in place. I'm not cranking it down because look what happens if I crank it down. It already flipped over to the other side. But I have this canted out at whatever you want to say, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. I fold it back. And again, I've got that little tip of material I can get there. Mm -hmm. Right? And that allows you to vary the color from the top and the bottom as well as towards the head. And sometimes I, I didn't bring, uh, let me see, I'll show you another trick. Sometimes it's nice to have like, we'll do it on the next tie, to have like little rosy cheeks on the side. We'll, we'll put some cheeks on this. So let's get that there. This is a little thin now, so I'm gonna get a little more material. I, I almost always tend to fold it back against itself because it's easier to work with shank hanks that are, you know, five inches, six inches, 12 inches gets in the way. Um, take a little bit of this maybe. So that's a thick-ish amount. Again, it's just a repetitive process. It's like stacking deer hair. But the thing about this is once you get the hang of it, I could have I, I mean, I could have finished two flies by the time we're, we're talking this through to show the technique, but it is not time consuming. So here you go again, right? There that is sticking out at that angle, fold it back. So if you guys look, there's just a little bit there and pinch it. Mm -hmm. So I've now pinched that tiny little doubled over section. One, two, three. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, because like if you think about a, a high tie, low tie type pattern, it actually ends up being two dimensional. Because right, because it's, it, it's it's all up and down, right? It's all up and down, right? Whereas so this is so that's down. that's not only less imitative, but it's also less effective in in creating that kind of bullet head that you want. Yeah. Uh, do, do any of you guys know? I mean, there are probably people here who are like fly tying historians, but any of you guys familiar with Bill Catherwood's flies? Bill Catherwood was this great guy. He lived up in Boston, master fly tire. He used to take these big, almost like shark hooks. You need to have saddles and emu and all kinds of stuff. Um, they often had upturned eyes and then he tied deer hair right at the front. So he had this little, little knot of deer hair and it wasn't tightly spun. He left it kind of messy, little knot of deer hair and then all the stuff. And then he would trim it to this round front. And it was just amazing. And I remember running to him and he was an old man in the Joppa Flats up in Boston. And he said, I can't cast too good, but I know what to do once it's in the water. And I was looking at his flies. And I was thinking you could just dangle those things in the water and the stripers <laughs> would come calling. So and I think we'll for people again. who are not used to tying with synthetic materials as much, like you don't have to worry. I mean, that's why you're not worried about the length on either side is because it's not like there's a natural taper in the, the diameter of the hair. No, I, and I've seen people do that. And it's just, it's just a waste of time because the, the taper is going to come from this thing. And that actually, and, and then I actually have some tips I can show you guys. And I'm sure that there are people on this call of tied with synthetics and you develop your ways of trimming. You know, we all have our own little tricks. Um, one thing I do want to say um, is that since I do a lot of these tying demos is it is worth watching every single fly tire on the planet. And I mean, from 12 year olds to the you know famous veterans, when I've gone to fly fishing shows, I might see a guy whose style I don't like, or he's tying, you know, Atlantic salmon flies, which is one of the only style of flies. That, actually, that's not true. I have to add salmon flies, but you can learn a trick or something from absolutely everybody. Like people have hacks, right? I saw a guy using one of these little hair clips to hold materials back. I thought that was brilliant, right? 
So if I'm going to trim something, maybe I'll do that. Oh, there are just great. so many people adapt their own. There's no way, right way to tie a fly, wrong way to tie a fly. So, um, so this is just how I do it. You guys might come up with a 10,000 times more effective way of attaching synthetics. Um, one question I know that a lot of people have asked is, why don't you just use a dubbing brush and wrap it? What I found with dubbing brushes, particularly with these synthetics, is they don't lean back. Remember, we were talking about um, deer hair, how deer hair sort of pops up perpendicularly. A, a dubbing brush of slinky fiber, you can get it to lean back a little bit, but it'll never have this kind of density and it'll never have the proper angle. I won't be able to put the color where I want it, but I, I promised you guys rosy cheeks. So we're going to add some rosy cheeks. So here's just some pink for our blend, right? I'm just going to take a tiny little bit here on the side only. Okay, so that's a departure. It's not on the side, it's not on the top of the This bottom. is just a side. color accent, right? Yeah. And just fold it back on itself. That's, and you'll see, we're going to trim out so much of that stuff that it's just going to look like a little halo of pink behind the eyes. Mm. But for, I have, I have to say in watching these flies swim in the water, sometimes having just a little, I don't like like startling contrasts in flies, but sometimes having like a little accent color, a little pink or a little lavender, a little yellow, you know, bunker have so much yellow on them. I've, I, if you watch the fly swim, those little accent colors really stand out because this white slinky fiber really washes out. So to give you an idea about hey, how Johnny, you have to have, yeah. Hey, Johnny, can you, yeah. when you clip the next time, can you show everybody the angle you're putting your scissors at? Because that's sure, really sure. interesting to me. Yeah. Sure. Um, here, so, uh, so if, if, I don't know how well you can see, but we've got that lump there, right? It's a little lumpier on the top than the bottom. I'm going to take advantage of that little extra space there to tie in my white. And, you know, the next time I tied, I, it might be the other way around, but I think I had used a slightly thicker one. So I've taken this material, I folded it, right? Snip. So now I'm gonna, I've used a little bit less because if you get, if you use really thick clumps near the head of the fly, it's going to be hard to finish it off. But I'd say we have two, possibly three more, three more applications. But what I'm going to do is to tie that somewhat less dense clump there. I want to be able to cover up those lumpy things. I'm just going to fold it back gently and pinch it. Take it with my left hand. So can you guys all see that little? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if I if that was twice that big, then I'd have I can actually get probably multiple applications. So now, if you'll see, there's a little bit of a gap there. So just use your fingernails to kind of pinch it. Mm -hmm. You can always redistribute this stuff, right? I can always go like this, like this. And again, I don't care about gaps. Like if you can see the thread wraps underneath, who cares? It's mm -hmm. not. It, it sometimes the messier, bulky, the the sort of fuzzier heads actually fish and swim better. Um, one of the first times that I ever fished this fly, I was, my wife had a business trip. I ended up in Naples. So I was fishing a Stero Bay, took it out. And this snook guide was really into them. But these are the first ones I ever tied. So these are little like black and purple ones or maybe only three, four inches long. And what we noticed is the ones with the pointy noses tended to bob and weave a little bit more than the ones with the fat heads. I don't know why, but sometimes if you can get a really pointy nose there that really angles out, it'll just tend to swim almost like a Zara spook. And yet you put that, that rod under your arm and you're ripping it back as fast as you can, it'll track straight. Tracking is extremely important in flies. It's extremely underappreciated because there are a lot of flies that look great that don't swim properly. You know, you can see it. People have those swim tanks at the fishing show. You'll yep. see them all, the, the flies flipping up on their side. And if I see a fly flipping up, I've seen like bluefish and stripers and all kinds of fish, uh, trout, bass, like freshwater bass turn off of flies that, um, that don't track properly. So I have that little bit left. Still going to, I'm going to put in, this is a much, much less dense, much narrower because I don't want to create too much bulk there. So I'll go one, two, three, fold that back just to cover up some of those wraps. One, two, three. And you guys, if you're using mono thread, some people prefer to use, um, uh, 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 you know, nylon thread, like 
three odd Danville is pretty good. I just find that the mono thread disappears and it um, holds this material well. But you have to have a light touch because if you really crank on it, it'll break it, real you, easy. Yep. You know, I tie my trout flies with 12 or 14 on thread, and I'm fine. I even tie big flies with 14 on thread. Sometimes I use, so there, did you see? I screwed that one up. That's a good illustration of it. So I have that, take that out again. I have a little, little clump there, right? A little bump. So I probably need to thin this out a little so that I can tie that down. So look, and I don't want to create too much bulk. So just get maybe two wraps, fold it back. Just got a little extra coverage there. Perfect. So now like you could finish the fly, but that looks ugly to me, right? Like flies don't have little noses and beaks. I want it. I want the taper to start immediately behind the hook. Eye. So now Eric, to, to, to follow up on one of your questions, we're going to depart. Now we're going to do an actual high time. Mm -hmm. Because this is basically like doing a, like a hollow fly. So what I'll do is hollow fly and then I'm gonna post, I'm gonna tie it top and bottom and post it back. So now get right in there in that tiny little valley between the last bump, right? So you got what, like a 16th of an inch there, maybe, right? Uh, no, not even. Not I even. have probably a millimeter or two. Okay. I will lay that on there. One, two. I'll make sure it's well distributed. I'll get a little white stuff. You can also put, sometimes I like to put some pink stuff there. Why don't we throw a few pink fibers in there? You can mix the stuff. But we are making a massive production out of this fly. They do not take this long to tie. <laughs> but, but you know, that the, the, if you, I, I have tied so many thousands of these, you, you know, you learn your tricks. Now here, if you look, I have a little bit of an open spot there. Is that visible? Yep. So what I'll do is I'll steal some of this hair from here. Again, not worrying about tapering it and just tie it on there, mm. right? A little better coverage. What about there? Yeah, not bad. Maybe I could use a little more stuff on the top. Mm. Fold it on top. So I have just tied materials top and bottom, right? I haven't V-tied it. There's the tan stuff on top, the white and pink stuff on the bottom. So now, unlike where the prior um, steps where I folded it, created that little nib, nib, I've tied it in that way. I'm gonna take a, you, you don't need one of these devices. This is just a little clear plastic tube. And I'll push that back, right? And if you'll notice, I have left literally no room, right? So you're thinking, how is this idiot gonna finish this flush? And I like to push that back in there. But what I'm going to do is, this is just like tying a hollow fly or any reverse fly. And this stuff really wants to spring forward, right? So what you do is you tie about 10,000 thread wraps. Now, you don't need 10,000. <laughs> but so we'll be here but for it's, another. But it's a, it's, it's a thread down. It's a, it, exactly. It's a thread down. And here's the trick. I'm using mono thread. If I just tie in one place, I'm going to create an avalanche, right? So if I just sit here and go like this. You know, at a certain point, it's going to go, it's going to be a slinky and pop off the front of the hook. Mm -hmm. So what you do is hold it back as tightly as you can. Now, what I noticed is this guy is sticking out. So use your thumbnail to distribute that stuff. Mm. Pull it back hard and you'd be amazed. Like it's amazing how much material using this technique you can get in at the front of the hook. Mm. So I'm still seeing that a little bit. And you're not wrapping over the doubled material there. You're wrapping in front of it to really. Yeah, but I'm starting, I'm starting to like go up the dam a little bit. Okay. So I probably. As like, you build the taper, you can go up on it a yeah. little bit. <clears throat> exactly. But, but to prevent the avalanche, I should do some wraps up front, then work my way back. And then, you know, I can actually look. So I have this thread. I can see exactly where that's going down and I can put pressure on it. So when I'm wrapping, I push back. When I'm wrapping, I push back. See how that's starting to stay in place? Mm -hmm. So that's probably good for now. Wow. Another trick with mono thread is it really likes to spring out, right? So what I do is I do like three whip finishes. Uh, I don't use a whip finisher or if you're just a half-inch guy, you know, one, two, three. But I'll do like three or four 
turn what finishes. So that if one springs open, ultimately I'm gonna glue over this so it doesn't matter, but for the tying process. Okay, so that process that, that where, where we took forever to do that, that actually would only take you about, I don't know, seven or eight minutes if you're really cranking through it. And I really packed the stuff in there. So now what do you do with this catastrophe of a fly, right? Like that does not look plausible that that could ever be an acceptable fly. But I promise you, we will make it look um, presentable. So what I do is, and here you guys need to coach me if I am going out of focus, but I have all this excess material. Here's how I like to trim it. I squeeze it top to bottom. Can you guys see? I'm just gonna hold it straight up in the camera, right? Can you guys see that? So it's- yeah, We can see your front view. You might wanna push it away from you a little bit so we can see it from the top view. Yeah, that's great, perfect, yep. And what I do is I pinch it this way and I use my fingernails as a guide for my fingers to cut off all that extra material. Mm. Turn it around, same deal. So that I was squeezing top to bottom, right? So that all this stuff, look at all that extra. Oh, we forgot. Look, I could have harvested this great piece here. I'll use it for another one. <laughs> so that was squeezing top to bottom. Now what I'll do is I'll squeeze side to side and do the exact same thing, all right? So if you're looking at it this way, I'll squeeze side to side. I got the mohawk there, right? The mohawk, this, this punk rocker needs a trim. <laughs> Same thing. This is advanced barbershop, right? <laughs> Squeeze it. If any of you guys have ever um, tied deer hair bass bugs, it's like the first three or four cuts you do with a razor blade. So still way too much material, right? So look at all that material. I don't need a fraction of that. So what I'll do is I'll come in behind it. Maybe you guys can see it there. Yep. And I'll start to taper it. Don't need all that excess material. What's amazing is having tied this fly now for more than a decade in massive quantities, I still, I still tie in too much material. But for instance, you know, for it, like um, Enrico, who ties his great uh, um, synthetic flies with his material, he's always saying, use sparse amounts. I actually don't care what I use because so much of this is in the trimming. Okay, so we're starting to get something like a bait fish shape, and now it's just a matter of squeezing and trimming. So there's too much up there. It's always about squeezing. Squeezing it again, there's too much on the side. This can also be like the compulsive, you know, you tie your fly, you say, oh, that looks like a mullet, and you come back after dinner, you're like, it's a little, <laughs> little portly. And that's how your bunker becomes, you know, uh, a banch over your mummy child. So now, now that I've got that, at least I've gotten it to a, a, a you know, something like a proper shape. Then I can, use, if you have a rotary vise, this helps a lot. Literally just trim in the round. And dig into it. You need a good pair of scissors, but dig into it to get that meat there. And I want that. But do you remember we were talking about the smooth outline? So I want an uninterrupted transition there. That's the whole key. Because imagine if you had done this with um, with deer hair. There's no way, like, like I like to tie snake flies, but you know, snake flies with deer hair, it's tough to get it to flow into that back. So can, I, I, it's hard to know what it looks like, but is it starting to look like a- Yeah, no, we can totally see it. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing to watch it come to life. Yeah, it's a fun fly to tie because I have found that you can kind of, you know, accomplish any shape with it. So I don't know, we, we just spent um, whatever it was, 40 minutes tying this fly. But yeah. this, is, this is about, I would, this is not a five minute fly, but it's also not a half an hour fly. So a couple of tricks about trimming. So I'm gonna make this a mullet, right? Which to me is a very generic shape. If you actually look at a mullet head on, it's kind of cylindrical. It's got slightly broader shoulders up here and then the belly tapers down a little. So what I will do is I will take this belly and I will triangulate it a little bit. It's almost like the opposite of what I did with the tented saddles. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the top, although I might leave the top a little wider. 
But because I have this, because I have so much excess material there, I can, you know what, it's almost like wood carving, right? You have this kind of canvas now and you can make any shape you want. So there, that's getting, you know, that's probably could use a little more trimming, but that's, that's a basic shape. So let me show you guys something. When you look at it head on, you're seeing the cylindrical profile of a bait fish, right? You're not seeing a two dimensional shape. And um, let's see from the overhead, you'll yeah. see that all the way around, you've got that shape. And again, it's just a matter of trimming it, trimming it, trimming it, trimming it, trimming it. So that's the basic pattern. I can show you guys how I, do you want, um, Eric and Lou Yuan, do you want me to show you how I attach eyes? Yeah, well, I, so, think, well, I think that's really important. Yeah, until I mean, so it's interesting because we we had David on last week, and he and he he's his philosophy is that eyes are not important for catching fish; they're important for catching uh, anglers. I'll let him speak uh. to that. But <laughs> what's your thinking about that, Johnny? Like, how important do you think the eyes actually are in these flies? Don't. For, my first thinking is don't believe anything that Dave Lincoln tells you. Well, wait, that's, that's, that's our motto for Masters of yeah, the Yeah, so, no, I like eyes. What I have found is uh, there are a lot of bait fish where, um, where the eyes are really prominent. You know, Bob Popovic has a really interesting theory about it. He thinks eyes don't matter on big flies. They have matter on little flies, right? So that if you have a little bait fish pattern like that, they're super um, conspicuous. I, first of all, they certainly don't hurt. Second of all, I do think that they give the fish a target. And I, what I think fish see a lot of times is contrast. Um, different contrast in different colors. If you're on a bright sunny day, um, you know, a chartreuse and white fly might be great. If you're fishing in the morning, black and white might be. And I believe that when you put eyes on a fly like this, it creates another contrast point. Plus, um, you know who was a big, big believer in eyes on flies was absolutely convinced was Lefty Cray. I, I used to tie these for him because Lefty used them for peacock bass and for smallmouth. And he thought eyes were absolutely critical. So, um, so what, you know, what, what cement are you using? Okay, so people always ask about glues because you have this kind of spongy head. So yes. I, I have two steps to attach eyes. And when the eyes are attached this way, you would need a pair of pliers to get them off. So this stuff is called E6000. It's like goop or something. This is mostly just to hold them in place. I buy these little tubes because they tend to dry out quickly. I take a little dab, right? Little dab will do With you. With your bobbin, yeah. And then just dro uh, drop it right there so it actually gets in the material a little bit. Um, another thing about eyes, particularly a lot of guys you'll notice will tend to put their eyes right up um, the way they tie the flies, they'll put them right up here. But that's obviously not, it's partially because they're using light cured resins to get it there. But eyes are not, look at almost any bait fish. Like look at a sand eel, the eyes are set quite far back. It's, it's not anatomically correct. Right. And so if you're going to bother to put on eyes, then you might as well put them in the right place. I usually find that they're a little bit of the way back, a quarter, maybe three eighths of an inch back and um, a slightly above the lateral line. So what I'll do is, Take this guy and pop it in here. You'll see what will happen though, because I'm going to squeeze these really hard to get that glue into the material and that will slightly deform the head. So watch this. I'm going to squeeze this really hard. And then did you see it slightly? That's why I leave a little more material. I should have mentioned that before. Before um, I don't trim it all off because when I do that, I'm narrowing the fly. So I usually do a second trim after that. I mean, this is, you know, compulsive fly tying 101, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, look, this is, this fly would be a great all-purpose fly anyway. So anyway, I've got those glued on and, and in place. Then I coat them with this material. I, do, I, I put in a little brush bottle. It's called liquid fusion. The reason I switched to this stuff is three reasons. It's non-toxic. It, I used to use Plasti Dip. It, it cures, it, it, it thins with water. And when I thin it to this consistency, so the best I could say is, like maple syrup type consistency, it shrinks. So I will literally, literally saturate the area around that eye. And what will happen is, and this does not happen with light cured acrylics, and this stuff is seven bucks a bottle, and this is a fraction of a bottle, is I'll show you. I'll take a huge, ridiculous amount, and I'll just keep dumping it in there because it will get sucked into the material. 
Mm. You can thin it as thin as water. But for instance, I just dumped all that stuff. That's all going to shrink. What happens is it's surrounding the eye 360 degrees. It's getting absorbed into the material behind it. And it's also flexible. It's not rubbery, wow. but it's so. So what happens is the eye, when this dries, will be surrounded, not just on top. There's not just a dome of glue. There's um, it's 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 literally encased. It's like it's entombed in this plastic. Uh, it's actually urethane. I also always run it all around the um, the thread wraps, and I often try to saturate the whole portion of the head. So it'll be hard-ish, but it won't be like epoxy. So most light cured acrylics will not um, get absorbed this way. This is so much cheaper. You're not having any exposure to the UV light. You Johnny, can get quick, this stuff on your hand. Quick question. You're thinning that liquid fusion with uh, water, correct? Yep. So I yep. just put it in one of these little brush bottles. It'll, after a month or two, it might get a little hard. Just put some drops of water in. So here, I'll just show you. You want it this consistency. I'm holding it, I'm holding it, I'm holding it. It dropped. Hmm. You know, and if you're a little worried about fouling, you could put a little piece there. You know, like Dave Skoke um, used to tie, used to tie um, his mush mouths by putting a little soft X fine on it. Does that have sort of a soft X kind of texture to it once it's- Oh, oh yes, it actually does. But you know, soft X is like some seriously carcinogenic stuff. This yeah. stuff, I get you can get all over your hands, it peels off. It is absolutely invincible. I have a friend who's a steelhead guy out in Oregon and he built a rod with one. And he said mm -hmm. it shrinks so much, he had to do about 12 rod wraps. But he said, you couldn't take these, you, you'd have to break the metal to get the guides off the rod. So there is the kinky muddler, and I'm just trying that to is think. A gorgeous fly, Johnny. That is an absolutely beautiful fly. So I just want to make sure here. Let's see if you guys can see it from all angles. Oh, and and since you're you're using the vice to display this, there is a question about the vice you're using. This vice. This is a very fancy vice that was given to me as a gift. This is a CNF design vice. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing, and amazingly expensive piece of machinery. It, um, it'll hold any hook. So I tie a lot of little tiny dry flies. So I can put a size 22 in there and I have put up to an 11 on those big owner long shank hooks, which are you know way beyond anything you would um, do fishing wise, fly fishing wise. Here's a couple of cool things about it. With this arm, I can make it go up and down. But even closer than that, the jaws themselves, so it obviously it's rotary and I do do some rotary tying, but it, um, the jaws rotate this way. So let's say I want to see what the fly looks like directly. I actually would like to show you guys. Can, can you see that in the front yep. view? Yeah. Yep. So do you see how it's kind of got the shoulders on top? Yep. Right? No, it, tw it twists it a little bit more and we'll see it on the top view. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Amazing. Yep. So there, there you, you go. go, there you go. That's incredible. So, and that's just all, there's, there is no magic to that. It's just that all of that material is canted back, right? So it flows into the tail and, mm -hmm. and there you have it. So that's your basic that's great, sort Johnny. of stick. Amazing, amazing stuff, really great. I know we are in overtime at this point. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and, but everyone is riveted to uh, talk about glue. Everyone is glued to their sets. We haven't. No, nope, nobody's them. left. <laughs> I, I do have one question, Johnny. Yeah. Do you, with that glue amount of glue you use, is there any reason to rotate that fly? Will it drip out or will it stay? No, no, no. It's it's uh, the thing is, Dave is it's getting absorbed. If you can see this up close, yeah. it's gotten absorbed into that, so it's not drippy. I mean, sometimes if I've like overdone it. You know, maybe I'll, I never put it on a dryer, right? How, but, how long does it take to dry? Oh, it takes a long time. It takes forever. It, it'll it be <laughs> a few hours before this is totally dry. Oh, but uh, uh, it, that's uh, because I put so much in it, but it is worth it because it's, the stuff is called liquid fusion or they sell it at craft stores. It's called uh, Eileen's Fabric Fusion. Hmm. It, it doesn't smell and I use it, um, I, I use it in, in many different ways. You can also, you don't need to thin it. If you want it goopier, you can. I just like to have it thinned so that it's absorbent. And when you thin it, rough rough ratio? It, you know, I can't generalize. And the reason is because every tube is different. It, because it's water-based, what I would say is you want to thin it. What I do is I'll fill it up 
three quarters of here and I'll just put some water droplets in it, shake it, lift the brush out, shake it. If I think maple syrup is like a good, um, good, good uh, target uh, catcher to go for. Excellent. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, Johnny, hang on a bit. And uh, Lou and Eric, uh, let's turn our cameras on for a minute. Yep. yep. Um, and uh, um, I just want to, Johnny, you're going to stick around so we can do a little overtime with you and maybe possibly tie another fly if we have time. Um, uh, I just want to say uh, before some people sign off that uh, Johnny, tonight that was amazing. Unbelievable. I, I was incredible. riveted. Thank you. A I lot was of fun. riveted, to, not only to your piano playing, but certainly to your fly tying. Um, we have, we have, uh, you know, this is our fourth event, and you know, Lou and I can't believe how quickly you know it's the time's gone by. We have Ken Eklund, Tony Friedrich, and and James Prosek all coming up. Ken is on uh, 321, Tony's on 411, and James Prosek is on uh, May 2nd. So uh, yeah, and here's here's everything that's posted in our dates. Um, and, and you know, again, as I said a week, a couple weeks ago, um, all these flies are gonna be taken and tied and fished sometime during the season, which we'll be using as some content. Uh, these flies will certainly be um, in uh, the piece in uh, Tail Fly Fishing Magazine uh, in the next edition. Um, Johnny, again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, this was really a, a very special, um, special fly tying session with you. Uh, yeah. and, and thank you so much. Lou? Amazing. No, thank you so My much. Pleasure. Thanks to Eric uh, for, for emceeing and, and, and doing the Q&A, but uh, an amazing evening. And I think everyone learned a ton. We could have kept you on for about five more hours, but uh, thank you. Well, hey, 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 we, we might just do that. And we, <laughs> we might just do that, exactly. <laughs> But I actually, Lu Luyan, can I can I just jump in and just right. since we might lose some people before we get into extra time, I just wanted to remind everybody how important it is to just review the chat before you leave. Go back up to the uh, to the to the post there from Tom Kaczynski about um, Amendment Seven uh, for striped bass. It's super important that you take the time to write. Um, and, and remember that it's not a form letter. Don't copy all of the same language. Just incredibly important that you contribute some public commentary to, uh, to Amendment 7 and make sure that uh, the conservation that we depend on for the fishery that, that, that we so enjoy uh, continues. Yeah, we, we certainly don't want to go back to what happened in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, that, that would be a disaster on uh, both uh, an ecological and a socioeconomic level. And then it doesn't matter what your fly looks like. That's right. Very true. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Anyone who wants to watch the end of the uh, the NBA All Star Game, you can. You're you're dismissed. But for those of us who want to learn more, <laughs> we're going to stay on. So uh, with that, let's uh, let's keep talking, Johnny. Yeah. Um, there were yeah. a couple of questions here as as we're sort of talking about this a little bit more. Um, one question was how long a fly you could reason reasonably make with this method. And I, I've seen some flies of yours that are quite long, but what's a long yeah, fly? The, um, yeah, a full adult bunker. You know, I look, I mean, there are people who tie 16 inch long flies for a bunker. I have never found that to, well, first of all, there've been many times when I've been fishing in a dunk bu adult bunker pool and the only thing that would work would be a snagged bunker. So like, it, it's hard to really <laughs> imitate. Um, I, I'd say a foot, I tie some really big, um, you know, a big eight aught gamakatsu, um, use some squimpish hair, some long saddles. Uh, and then really what's funny is you don't actually use a lot of the synthetic material. You use that just as almost like a facing up front, right? Like, cause if you tie in too much stuff, it'll, it'll destabilize, um, destabilize the fly, but up to about a foot. Um, but you know, most of, I don't fish flies that are foot. I haven't found that necessary in most of my fish. I mean, people have caught sailfish on them on big ones. Um, but have you fished these for tuna ever? Oh yeah. They were during that period of time when, um, when there were small bluefin around, like when I used to go up to Cape Cod, this, yeah. this was the main fly we're using. When I say small, you know, I mean like anywhere from 25 to 75 pounds. Yeah. They, they loved them. They're not necessarily the most selective fish. It's more a matter of being able to get there and 
and get to a breaking tuna. I use little ones for Albie. I was actually thinking that we could use this time to show some of the variations. Yeah, I, actually, that would be, be great. Why don't you show some of the flies? Yeah, so this is this is the whole like the master recipe idea, right? Okay. You've, we've we've you you've just explained the technique, the concept, and now you, we you can adapt it to in in so many ways. And maybe Johnny, you could show as you did, you know, teased us at the very beginning, you know, how many different ways you can adapt this technique. Yeah, sure. And and just and if other people had like actual questions, technique questions or something. Um, For yeah, sure, the Q and the Q and A is still open, by the way. Yep. And someone asked if you could show your kink, uh, a kinky squid, and I, we looked at one of those, sure. those earlier today. So we'd love for you to show sure. that. You know, I was just looking uh, while you guys were talking. I was looking at the participants group. I'm seeing a lot of friends in there. So I just saw Al Q, Al Quattrochi. So I know Al's out on the West Coast, but he's an East Coast guy. And Al ties a really good squid. That's what made me. So hey, Al, if you're still on. Um, <laughs> And Al, Al's also really, uh, he, I think he uses synthetics. Um, we, I think we're like-minded that way. Um, so why don't we do that? So we just talked about dimension. So let's look at a, a couple of different ways you could do that. So I brought one squid, I tied this one yesterday and I tried to make this as few materials as possible. Often I'll tie an extension off the back. Key with squid is you want that mantle to be about two thirds of the length. At least our squid, you know, we have the squid we see here in the Northeast are mostly short fin squid, sorry, long fin squid, but they're, they're still, um, they still have relatively short tentacles. None of this stuff moves, right? A squid has something in the middle of it called a pen. It's like actually an ancestral shell. So we've got the swim fins up here that move. And I used to, used to stack fox fur in here, but it's not worth the trouble. Um, but this is just some fox fur and some flash. And then this is just kinky muddler tied on a big long spinner bait hook. But what I did is I will grab 10 different colors and I'll just make every stack different because you know, squid have these things called chromatophores and um, they change colors on a dime. Um, so that's, that's a squid. So I will say for a kinky muddler squid, I like to keep them in the you know seven inches and under range for really big squid. If you have too much stuff on there, that becomes a little, I have better ways to create that body that you wouldn't want it to become too heavy. But um, I find fish just love squid all the time. How many times have I caught a bluefish? Like you could catch a bluefish by the Verrazano um, and he'll cough up a squid. They're always around. There was a big squid run in New York Harbor in late October this year. So that's one. Let me just show you um, a trout fly version. This is a kinky muddler that I caught some fish on the beaver kill, probably around Thanksgiving, probably on this fly. Caught brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, little deceiver tail. That's a zonker and just a little kinky muddler head with um, different material called sculpting flash fiber, which is finer and it's more compressible and it sinks very well. Um, here is the same fly Again, I'm, I mean, it's a freshwater, it doesn't really matter. That's a Matuka, right? So I just bound the hackles on there. So it's just a way to make a little head. Those are like variations of muddler minnows. Um, I like poppers that make a lot of noise. I mean, I, I caught a lot of stripers in my life on gurglers on, and the flats of Cape Cod. But like when you're fishing, especially the kind of New York Harbor, Raritan Bay, um, some of the rocks and the islands, it's really nice to have something that makes a lot of noise. So this is basically a kinky muddler tied to three quarters of the hook shank, sliding on one of these howitzer poppers, which has a little cavity behind it. This thing makes an ungodly amount of noise because this is how it sits in the water. <laughs> bluefish, like, like a 12 pound bluefish or, or like a 15 pound stripper will just have this, it sits like this. So all of this stuff submerges and then you pull it and goes, Pum. And the other thing is if you put a foam cylinder on and you cut it this angle, it'll dive and it'll actually dive pretty deeply. You, you could get it to, to, to swim down about a foot or so, and then it'll float back up. It's my favorite popper. I tie these for largemouth bass, little versions of these. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So we were talking about a snake fly before. I tied this yesterday. I just took some, I took a little bucktail. I threw in some ostrich earl. I wrapped a collar of marabou and I tied in a kinky muddler head. So, um, and again, it's not deer hair. It's a little less buoyant than deer hair, but I can get any shape that I want. Um, 
I like to tie, here's a big one. This is a big full bodied kinky muzzler. This is a mullet that you might use on the beach for like beach tarpon or um, rooster fish on the beach. Or we get those mullet, we get them here in New York Harbor for a short time in, Septem in September. And um, uh, they're usually, they could be anywhere from six to nine inches, you know, and they have a pretty bulky body. Or like on the Jersey Shore, I think I just saw Joe Pfeiffer asked a question out down by where Joe lives. They get a mullet run in the fall, you know, those corn cob mullet. Um, and that, this material is called squimpish hair. It's my favorite. I actually prefer this to bucktail. Just amazing stuff. It's incredibly mobile. It, you can, it comes much longer than bucktail. It's, it's like souped up craft fur. But if you look, if you want to know how your fly is going to swim in the water, take a blow dryer or hold it out the window because that's what it's like. That tail will just kick like crazy with that big fat head. And That's how do you think a, about, uh, about natural versus synthetic material in general, Johnny? I mean, do you have a preference? Do you feel like yeah, so that, are getting better and better than the natural materials? That, that's one of the great dumb debates in fly tying, right? Like people will say, oh, I only use synthetics, I only use naturals, and I like, I only use whatever works on the fly. There are synthetic materials, there are natural materials like polar bear. Polar bear is cool stuff. It doesn't, um, doesn't swim at all, right? unless it's really long, it's about the stiffest stuff in the world. There's nothing that swims better than craft fur, right? You can buy it, you could harvest it off of a like plush toy. Um, I just find, I, for whatever reason, I always gravitated to mixes. So there's fox fur, right? But there's a kinky muddler body. There's- um, Hey, Johnny. Yeah. Johnny, I think we have somebody who may want to share their fly with us. Uh, oh, that would be great. I would love to see it. Yeah, Who's that? Tom, can you do that? Yes, I just promoted Joe Pfeiffer to panelists. So, uh, so Joe, that's who I was just talking to. Joe is a very good fly tire and has a lot of his own good patterns. And is also a fishing machine. He's always always down there on the shore. Yeah, Joe, turn on your camera. There he is. Oh, there he was. Joe was here for a second. There he is. Hey, Joe. Yeah, let's unmute Joe. I don't see him. Oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Pfeiffer. Oh, nice can, we, uh, can we unmute him, Tom? Can you unmute him? There okay. he is. We got you, Joe. Working now? Yep. Yeah. Hey, hey Johnny. Did you, did you just tie that while we were talking? This one, yes. So can, can you hold it up, like like turn it towards, towards the, because uh, you're, yeah, it looks like you got the round shape. What, did you use um, slinky fiber? What'd you use? I used the, the Ferrar bond. The same, you know, right. the same stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the, the trouble I have, Johnny, is always the back end. Like, I'm always not sure how much to trim on the behind the hook. Yeah. So, what I would say there is you probably should trim a lot because it looks to me like the midsection at the, just at the what hook are you using? Do you know? That's the same one you have the, okay. the barrel off. You, you just, you want whatever is going past the hook at the hook bend, you want to be really sparse and more in the nature of a veil than anything like uh -huh. chunky. So you just want fibers. It's a little hard to see, but you just want fibers trailing back. You, off. you don't want, you want the meat of the fly to start about mid hook shank and everything else. Yeah. You know what, Joe? come in from the other direction. In other words, do it like this. Hold it like this and actually trim back to front. Okay. And, you know, when in doubt, um, thin it out a little bit because I have just found that like, it's kind of superfluous to have a lot of stuff back there and it'll interfere with the tail kick. You just need enough to get, keep that, um, to keep the flow of the fly, right? So that it, that it maintains its shape. You don't want to cut it so short so that you have an abrupt end to it. Can you see that now? Does that look better? Yeah, but turn it to turn it to its side. That's where you'd see it. Yeah. Now what I you've got a little bit too much of a forehead. Forehead. Also, so does your fly. Yeah. No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> forehead. So do, so this, this is, is what this happens is when I do. It, it's, it's really <laughs> hard to do this, but in other words, take what? your um, let me do a not wet one. This is actually great, actually, to see how. Yeah. Joe, so take that, and you want putting yourself out there. You, yeah. you, you, Thank you Joe. in other words, like hold it up, Joe. Yep. 
I feel like you've got like a little extra bulk stuff up there. So you want to just smooth that. Although that's, you kind of got a good bunker shape. But if you look at it, the tail looks like it's coming out a little bit lower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my, my buck tail was a little short, I think. The that's okay. That that, that's a great fly now, but that looks pretty, you should go swim that because that looks pretty densely packed. That might be a little floaty. Uh huh. And also since you've got the bunker shape there, it can also be, it doesn't have to be so round. In other words, you could That's take flatness. it. Yeah. All right. You could take, you could take it and really, and thin it outside. So yeah, it's not uh, that round actually. Yeah, I mean, it looks great, more. man. That looks a hundred times better than the commercially available ones. <laughs> oh, hey, Joe. So, one I really wanted to show Johnny was this fly. I don't know if you remember this one. You gave me this squid a long time ago. I can't even remember. Oh, there. Just, so hold that but up. So that is the, a squid that actually has this swim fit. It that, has the, that, the, the fox hair fins. Yeah, that's a pain in the neck because you have to tie that <laughs> in between. I know, I've never, I know, I've never tried it. You gave me this one as a model, but I haven't tried this one. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. But that thing would swim great, right? Because that would yeah. track right through. You fish that like down by you. And the, yeah. it was crazy. There were gannets picking up squid in striper blitzes in like end of October, early November this year, like Coney Island. Yeah, around. we haven't had squid in the New York bite and you know it for a while. The last yeah. couple years we had some it was like uh, but they're there, I'm telling you, Louis, Louis and they're they're just you just because you're not seeing them busting up. I've like like Dave, I've been fishing out in Montauk and I'll be running like or let's say we're fishing the bass blitzes and I'll like I'll yank my clouser and it'll come up with like an eight-inch squid on it. Like yeah, uh, I, I noticed that very often um in October I'll be fishing in Fort Pond Bay and uh I'll see bait spray and I'll see squid coming up behind them. So yeah. yeah they're really good, really good searching fly. Um, yeah. What I, I just, was gonna I show you- burned, guys, I just burned my spot, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna show you guys some other variations. This is a tube fly and I'm a big um, tube fly fan. I don't know if any of you guys fish tube flies. Uh, the great thing about a tube fly is, so there's the hook, right? You can use a short chain hook. The thing about particularly certain fish, stripers obviously hit up for the front, but trout, sometimes they swipe it at mid body or back. So this is a tube fly. It's got this little rubber junction thing. I can feed that on there. And then I don't have to use a long shank hook, which is, you know, gives fish a lot of leverage, like a real long streamer up. But that's like a nice, I don't know, it's probably close to a four inch fly. There's no mass on that. And I throw that on my spay rod but of course that could be a a, a a silver side just as much as it could be a freshwater bait fish i'll show you how small i can go with a kinky muddler this is using sculpting flash fiber there's a bay anchovy That's so bay anchovies i think have the coolest colors right mm -hmm. they, they're tan they're gray but i always find they have this kind of amber yellow on the top of them um and it's hard to take a picture so i just tied this one in all white and i took a copic marker just kind of an amber. So that's just some polar fiber and just some uh, uh, sculpting flash fiber and trim. But you can catch a, you can catch twenty of these on that. Nothing will happen to it. It looks great. Hey Johnny, I, I want to thank you again. You know, there's an old saying: leave them wanting more, right, Eric and Lou? <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, you know, it's it, it's getting on. But again, uh, I, personally, I can't thank you enough uh, for that. My pleasure. Why? Um, it was great. Uh, Eric, as usual, you really get to the heart of everything. And, uh, and as someone said a couple of weeks ago, you really are a secret sauce and you really help make tonight with Johnny that much more special. So uh, thank you. Um, Lou, any final comments? No, I mean, I just super appreciative and learned a ton. I mean, what a great evening and really appreciate all your time and, and your generosity. So thank you so much, Johnny, and uh, and and as that always, a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your collaboration, and hope everyone enjoyed this. This will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. Uh, uh, for those who want to go back and watch again, I know I'll be doing that as I'm tying uh, some of the uh, some of Johnny's flies. But uh, really appreciate it, and have a great night, everyone. And uh, thank you again for yes. joining us tonight. And and don't forget mastersofthefly.com. Thank you.